Hi, I'm Mrs. Bernasconi, and today we're going to talk about basic chemistry. We're going to do a quick review in this vodcast of some of the primary and key concepts necessary to understand biochemistry and the related chemistry of life. We'll talk about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and the basic types of bonds that are able to be formed. So our first question is, what are the kinds of subatomic particles that make up atoms? Remember that atoms are the fundamental particle. They are the smallest part of matter that it has all the properties of that particular element. Um, so those are atoms. So atoms are made up of protons, and protons are positively charged particles. And they have a weight of approximately 1 AMU. This stands for 1 atomic mass unit. Sometimes this is also called a Dalton. So the other particle that's found um, in the same location of the protons are neutrons. Both protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of an atom. So if I wanted to draw kind of a simplified atom, um, in the center part of it I would have protons and I would have neutrons. This would be the nucleus of the atom. Now, neutrons, on the other hand, um, are neutrally charged. They don't have a charge. And they also one, weigh one atomic mass unit. That is, that protons and neutrons added together yield the atomic mass of any particular atom. These are also located in the nucleus, and they're bound, they're stuck there by strong forces really binding them to those protons. Now, our third subatomic particle that we'll talk about biology is the electron. And electrons are very different than protons and neutrons. Electrons have a negative charge, and they have no appreciable weight. Their weight is so small compared to the weight of a proton or a neutron that we essentially count it as zero. They're located outside the nucleus, and they're in constant motion. So if you think about um, an analogy, if Fenway Park, if a baseball in Fenway Park would be the nucleus of an atom, then a fly buzzing around the park, that would be the equivalent of an electron. Okay? Um, the electrons are in constant motion. They are attracted to the nucleus um, and attracted to the protons because of the positive charge there. In science and in lots of things, it all comes down to rules of attraction. So the electrons are attracted to the nucleus because of the positive charge, um, but they can't get too close because they don't like to be that close to each other. So over here in our little model, our electrons would be flying around in kind of um, clouds outside the nucleus. Okay. we call these electron clouds. They don't stay in this one position, but um, they can be found in a variety of places around the nucleus. So protons and electrons have opposite charges to summarize, and we know that opposites attract. Opposites attract. So the positive charges in the nucleus, they balance out the negative charges in a neutral atom. So if in a nucleus I were to have um, two protons, I have two protons in this, in this nucleus, then to make this a neutral atom, I would need to balance it out with two electrons surrounding the nucleus. So one positive plus two positives is balanced out by the two negative charges. So the total charge on an atom like this would be zero. This neutral atom is, in effect, helium. If you look at a periodic table, you'll see that helium has an atomic number of two. And that 2 stands for the number of protons it has inside the nucleus. Protons are forever. So the atoms are neutral. So take a second now, follow along, see if you can label all the parts of this atom, and see if you can also figure out what um, element this might be. So first of all, I have here my nucleus. Nucleus is in the center of the atom. Inside the nucleus, I have protons and neutrons. But how can I decide in this picture what's a proton, what's a neutron? Hmm. Well, I know that in a neutral atom, my number of electrons has to equal my number of protons in a neutral atom. I know that my electrons are surrounding the nucleus. So here is my one lonely electron. If I have one electron, how many protons do I have to have to make this a neutral atom? 
protons, right? I would have just one proton. So the yellow circle here is my proton. The two blue circles would be my neutrons. So you can see that the number of neutrons can vary. It does not necessarily have to equal the number of protons. I also know that my proton has a weight of 1 AMU. And my neutrons each have a weight of 1 AMU. So this atom as a whole, this picture here, its atomic mass, which we arrive at by adding the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. If I were to substitute those numbers in, 1 plus 2, my atomic mass would be 3. We'll go over this again in a moment. My atomic number is equal to my number of protons. In this case, I have one proton, so my atomic number is one. If I were to look on the periodic table, I could find out that an element with the atomic number of one is hydrogen. Now, protons are forever. The atomic number is forever. If you change the number of protons, you change the atom entirely. Okay, This is so important. Remember this little catchphrase. Protons are forever. You do not ever change the number of protons in an atom because if you've changed the protons, then you've changed it into something entirely different. It's a totally new element. Protons are forever. Therefore, the atomic number is forever. It defines the atom. Neutrons come and go. Electrons come and go. They're fickle things. Protons are forever. They define the atom. So let's talk about what an element is and what some variations on an element might be. Now, all elements are... Um, pure substances that consist entirely of a single, of one type of atom. So for example, um, carbon is an element. Carbon is composed of carbon atoms. The carbon atom is defined in that it has six protons. Its atomic number is six. Um, all carbon, el all elements um, have their own specific type of atom. And each of these atoms is represented by an atomic symbol. That's the C when we're talking about carbon or O when we're talking about oxygen. These are atomic symbols. So a couple examples then for us um, are C stands for carbon, O stands for oxygen, and there are others. There are about 92 elements that um, exist naturally in nature, some other ones that we create. And the periodic table is a great place to find all this information. It has the atomic number, the atomic mass, and a whole bunch of other information about each element on it. Now, the number of protons, as we've said before, in an atom is its atomic number. It's what defines it. Protons are forever. Remember that electrons, neutrons, they can change. They can be variable. And all of these elements, um, all 92 that occur naturally in nature, and even those that we manufacture artificially, are arranged into that periodic table, which shows their different trends, that shows their different chemical properties. This is a great periodic table for you to go and check out. Um, you should definitely do so when you get a chance. Let's take a look at this um, example right here. So here we have um, carbon. The C, again, is its atomic symbol. But what do these other numbers mean? Well, the number that's up here in the top left-hand corner, this is the atomic mass of carbon. And if we recall, how did we figure out the atomic mass? See if you can go back and think about that. That's right. Atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. This equals the atomic mass. Remember that number of protons is also equal to the atomic number, and that's what we have here. The lower number on the left-hand side there is the atomic number. And that equals the number of protons. So if I have the atomic number and the atomic mass, I can also calculate out my number of neutrons. If we just plug this into our equation up here at the top, let's plug this in and see what we get. So the number of protons... I know is also my atomic number. In this case, it's six. I don't know my number of neutrons. That's what I'm looking for. That's my variable. And I know the atomic mass is 12. Well, if I subtract six from both sides of the equation, I'm going to get my number of neutrons, and I can see that my number of neutrons, in this case, 
also equals 6. So knowing the atomic mass and the atomic number, which are always available to you on the periodic table, you can interpret a lot of important information about um, a particular atom. Now, remember we said protons are forever, neutrons and electrons not so much. An isotope um, is a different form of the same element, and isotopes have to do with neutrons. So if I say isotope, you should say neutrons. So each isotope has the same number of protons, because protons are forever, but different numbers of neutrons, different numbers of neutrons. Um, some isotopes are radioactive, and if you're radioactive, these isotopes are unstable, which means that their nucleus is going to break down at a very particular rate, um, and it gives off various neutrons over time. Now, radioactive um, isotopes can be used for a variety of medical purposes. They can be used um, to detect cancer, to look for Alzheimer, and various other screenings. But radioactive elements and any type of radioactivity is also giving off high energy particles and that can damage your DNA and damage cells. So it's really important to limit the amount of radiation that you're exposed to. Now last but not least, let's talk about electrons. Electrons are what are important for chemical bonds. So a compound is when we take any substances, a chemical combination of two or more different elements in a definite proportion. Um, a molecule is the smallest unit of that compound. So for example, um, water. Water has the chemical formula H2O. Two hydrogens, a single oxygen. That's a definite ratio. Every single molecule of water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. They're combined in a definite ratio. And they're combined in a way that we form chemical bonds. So these electrons are flying around the nucleus, right? They're on the outside. And they're in these shells. They're in very definite energy levels. So there's some simple rules we need to know. First of all, is that the first shell, the first energy level of any atom is going to hold two electrons. And it's full and happy and stable with two. Okay. So if I have something like oxygen, oxygen's atomic number is eight. So in its first energy level, in its first energy level, it's going to have two electrons flitting around. One, two. If its atomic number is eight, that means it has eight electrons. So I've placed two of them. That means I have six electrons that still need a home. Okay. The second and third shells are going to hold up to eight electrons. So if I go now add another shell, I can see that I can have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Don't have eight, I have six. And here's the funny thing about atoms. Atoms are kind of like your family on Thanksgiving. Everyone gets a little feisty until they've had that big Thanksgiving meal. And I'm talking turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, corn, green beans, stuffing, the works, cranberry sauce, and don't forget my pumpkin pie. And if we haven't had all of that food, well, we're not quite happy yet. We're a little bit feisty still. But once we've had all those courses, we're full, we're satisfied. Atoms are the same way. They're feisty and they mix it up until their outer energy level is full. For most atoms, that outer energy level is full with eight electrons. We can see here that oxygen isn't quite satisfied. It only has six. So we need two more electrons to become full and stable. Okay? So, all important concept here, Atoms want to be stable, and they're willing to do anything to become stable. They're willing to steal electrons. They're willing to give up their electrons, and they're even willing to share electrons. So the question now becomes, how do we predict what is going to happen, and why is this important? Before we quite get to the why is it important, let's see if we can fill out this table here. Take a minute. Pause the video, see if you can go through and fill in this chart. We're going to be doing a lot more practicing with this, but see how you do now so that you're willing and able to ask questions. Pause the video here. When you filled out your chart, when you've written it out and tried all of these problems, then take a look, play the video again, and see if you, your answers match up with mine. All right, hopefully you've given this a shot and you're playing the video now. Um, check your work. See what you have questions on. One All right, let's talk about what atoms are willing to do to get, become stable. They're either willing to form what we call an ionic bond or a covalent bond. So important here, an ion is an atom that has a charge. Okay? Protons are forever, right? So what could I lose or gain that would give me either a positive or negative charge? That's right. I'd have to gain or lose an electron. Okay. 
If I were to gain an electron, I would have more negative charges than positive, and I would become a negative ion. But if I were to give away electrons, well, giving is good. It's a positive trait, and I would become a positive ion. So an ionic bond forms due to these rules of attraction. When one or more electrons is transferred and we create an ion, now we've got a positive ion and a negative ion, and they're going to be attracted to each other because opposites attract. This creates, so when I'm transferring, I'm creating a negatively charged ion and a positively charged ion, and we all know that opposites attract. So who gives and who steals? Well, if you remember that we want eight outer electrons to be stable. Another word for these outer electrons that you may come across is a valence electron. If I need eight to be stable, if I have almost eight, well, what's easier? If I have seven electrons, I could gain one electron to get stable, so seven valence electrons. Or I could lose seven electrons to become stable. What's more likely? You're right. The more likely solution is to gain a single electron. So if I have a near full outer energy level, I'm going to gain electrons. But if my energy level is almost empty, it's easier for me to give them away. The other kind of bond that can form is um, a covalent bond. And covalent bonds you can think of like an equal tug of war. In an equal tug of war, who wins? No one has an advantage. Well, you can't be in this perpetual tug of war forever, but there is a solution, and the solution is to share. So in a covalent bond, we're going to share electrons. This is the case with water. If we look at water, so here's oxygen. Remember that oxygen, its atomic number is 8. That means in its first energy level, it has 2 electrons. That means it has six still to place, so its second level has six electrons. It needs two more to be stable. So let's just draw these valence electrons around oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen, on the other hand, its atomic number is one. So it only has one energy level, and in its first energy level, it has one electron. Recall that the first energy level is small, so it only needs two to be stable. It needs one more electron. So if I were to draw my hydrogen, here's its one lonely electron. Hydrogen needs one more. Oxygen needs one more. They say, hey, why don't we share? So what forms? A covalent bond. Now oxygen isn't entirely satisfied because it still has only seven electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh it's sharing with this one hydrogen. How could we make hydrogen or oxygen completely happy? That's right, we could give it another hydrogen. And then another chemical bond would form. In this way, oxygen is happy and hydrogen is happy. And do you know what you've made? That's right, the miracle molecule. You've made water. In each one of these bonds depicted here, how many electrons are being shared? That's right, we're sharing two electrons in a single bond. All right, well, what if we made a double bond? How many electrons would we share then? That's right, each partner would be contributing two, so we'd be sharing four electrons. And in a triple bond? That's right, six electrons. Well, that wraps up our quick review of some basic chemistry that you're going to need to be successful in biology this year. I hope you found that helpful. Remember, practice, practice, practice. If you've got questions, make sure you go and talk to your teacher, and um, there's some great resources online again. Thanks, and see you next time.